Are you wondering about the value and integrity of open book testing? In recent months, there continues to be debate about testing practices in higher education. My name is Laura and I would like to welcome you to this presentation about open book, open web, take home written exams in higher education. I believe they are incredibly valuable and should be used more often during in-person and virtual learning. I have drawn ideas from my work as both an educator and student to illustrate why I think that more authentic assessment is needed in education. This presentation is primarily based on work done in a PhD in philosophy course at Queen's University, which is in the process of publication. One paper is in press and the other one is currently under review. Today, I hope to get you thinking about why we test students the way that we do. Testing is very stressful for students, but I believe it can also be a learning opportunity. It is my hope that attendees may leave this presentation with strategies for improving the inclusivity and integrity of their testing practices through approaching exams through a lens of authenticity. You may not act on all the recommendations in this presentation, but even small steps toward authentic and inclusive testing practices will have a large impact on student critical thinking, well-being, and success. I compare authentic open book, open web exams to traditional exams in this presentation. A traditional exam might be written on paper or on a computer and is typically invigilated to prevent cheating. Timed and closed book, meaning that students cannot use any class notes or external resources. There are many cases where exams allow for some modifications to these rules. Since the beginning of restrictions due to the pandemic, it has not been possible in some schools to use this kind of testing. It has also been recognized that exams and their associated duration, navigation, and technical issues increase student stress, promote poor health habits among students, and marginalize students who live in low-income, rural, and remote areas or those with unreliable internet access. An authentic exam is designed to be as close to what students will see in the real world as possible. I will break this down a little bit more later in the presentation, but often exams are open book or open web, which means they have no limits on resource use since nurses in the practice setting and other professionals have access to resources. And sometimes, most times in my cases, they invite collaboration between students because collaboration is an essential skill when we are talking about real world work environments. Open book and or open web exams may happen inside of a designated physical space or be taken home. When they are designed well, I believe the need for proctoring is reduced or even eliminated. The main reason that I changed how I test students even before the pandemic is that I believe authentic testing is better for helping students to develop the ability to think critically and function in their professional practice. Authentic testing is defined differently in some recent publications, which makes some sense because the definition of authenticity of a test depends on how it aligns with what students will need to do in the workplace following graduation. For that reason, I think authentic testing does not look the same in every situation. Common elements of authentic testing will be described after I talk a little bit about the history and philosophy of testing practices. When I started to think about why we test students the way that we do, it changed how I think about exams in my courses, which are mostly theory-based. Based on my discussions with other professors who teach science and computer courses, the ideas in this presentation have worked for them as well. Before I get too far into this presentation, I want to clarify that even though I think there are a lot of problems with traditional testing, I do think they have a place in some programs. For example, in nursing, where I teach, it makes sense to do some traditional testing to prepare students for their licensing exams. The problem, in my opinion, is that traditional testing is overused in education. Traditional exams have a long-standing history of use in academia to validate knowledge and measure how much someone knows. These measurements are often converted to numbers that are used to rank student abilities, which can impact them financially through scholarship uh, and program entry requirements. The belief that knowledge can be measured in the first place, that there is one objective measurable truth, and the idea that knowledge can be validated comes from a history of positivism in education. Positivism has led to the learning th theory of behaviorism, which focuses on teaching and learning through exposing students to stimuli in the environment and positive reinforcement like a small reward for achieving high grades. Multiple choice testing was developed based on Skinner's theory of operant conditioning, where immediate feedback when students chose the correct answer to a test was seen, as, as was seen to reinforce learning. Immediate feedback and rewards were key to this view on testing, and Skinner, the guy who developed multiple choice testing, also preferred constructor, constructed response questions over multiple choice questions. I guess I shouldn't say he developed them, but he was the founder of the theory that multiple choice testing is um, based on. There has been a lot of criticism in academic discourse 
of relying on positivism and behaviorism in education. For example, behaviorism has been heavily criticized in education for failing to account for internal influences on learning and the complexity of, skin, of um, human behavior. Skinner's theory of operant conditioning was based on experimentation with animals, and as we know, humans have more complex reactions to rewards and punishments than animals do. Relying on behaviorist approaches also creates a situation where students rely on external influences, like us as the teacher, to think and learn. And we want to create independent practitioners. In the 1970s, Paulo Freire critiqued the prevailing idea in education that students were like containers to be filled with knowledge. As you can see in this picture, Laura, the teacher, is filling students' brains with knowledge. When we position teachers as, as experts that control all aspects of learning, rely on lecture, and test for the purposes of seeing if students retain the knowledge that we threw into their heads, it creates a situation where learners are passive and disempowered. They are not encouraged to think for themselves. Students may memorize information, regurgitate on an exam without really understanding it, and forget the information very soon after the exam. In this approach, students typically have a hard time taking what they learned in school and applying it to their work outside of school. Several scholars throughout history have advocated for education that moves away from the idea of filling student minds with facts towards education that prepares students to function in the real world through asking them to go out and find, reflect on, and evaluate information in a rapidly changing world. In a traditional exam, learners are judged or scored based on how well they can recall or apply information in a manner that the educator says is correct. I don't think that educators intentionally oppress students, but I think that it occurs because of how we've been trained to educate and test students in our training. The first source of oppression that I'm going to talk about today is that in a traditional exam, the educator is positioned as the expert and often or sometimes um, may dislike being questioned about the accuracy of their exam. Instead, I advocate for transparent grading criteria and helping students understand how they are being evaluated to reduce this kind of oppression in any kind of exam, whether it's traditional or authentic. In a traditional exam, all decision-making power and, and grading rests with the educator. When educators decide not to provide a blueprint or outline for a test, or they provide one and then they don't align their test questions with that blueprint, it creates fear and anxiety among students and um, there are ways to overcome this. It's possible to share some decision-making power with students. For example, when is the exam gonna be? What learning outcomes? And even the kinds of questions are things that you can get some input from students on without actually let the, letting them write their own test. Some educators are unkind or unflexible with students and treat them as if students are inferior. When this happens, it creates a situation in which students are afraid to ask questions and may even make them feel justified for unkind behavior back towards their educators. It doesn't matter what kind of exam you are designing, I think it's important to be kind to educators and to reduce that source of oppression in any kind of exam. Also, critical thinking is suppressed when traditional testing is overused in academia, especially when the questions are not written to test critical thinking. Students need to be encouraged to ask questions and do more than just recall information. When we focus on memorization of facts, it be creates this highly problematic situation because in the real world, students are going to be asked to go out and apply the information that they have learned. There are many kinds of critical pedagogy that center around the idea of learner empowerment. In my practice, I use critical caring pedagogy because it integrates the caring focus of nursing with critical pedagogy. I go into more about this in the papers, but in a nutshell, educators using critical caring pedagogy, role model caring, inclusivity, and authenticity in a way that helps students become independent practitioners. Educators do so through actions such as engaging students in dialogue, building their professional capacity, exhibiting flexibility, and building a helping, trusting relationship with students. In critical caring pedagogy, the focus is on learning, not grades, and how educational activities, including assessments like exams, align with real world practice. During exams, educators can do these things by thinking about how their testing aligns with the real world setting and designing exams in an authentic way. 
Now we all know that cheating is talked about a lot in academia. Cheating has been a problem for a long time, and I believe that educators can reduce cheating through improving the authenticity of their testing practices. When we explain to students why our exams are authentic, it makes them less likely to cheat because they can see the value in actually doing the exam itself. The most common types of cheating also don't apply to my exams because I encourage them to use resources and I actually encourage them to talk to their colleagues during the exam. According to Lang, students are more likely to cheat when one, the structure or climate of the course emphasizes students' performance, such as through focusing on things like grades or competition instead of focusing on learning. So I've had several conversations with students where they're talking about stuff and I say, I'm more concerned about your, your learning than your grades. Uh, another thing is when performance is emphasized through high stake exams or any kind of assessment where a student feels their success relies heavily on a single evaluation. There are ways to have a 30% exam where you can have the stakes reduced a little bit by maybe offering them multiple opportunities to do that exam. Now that might not work in all situations, but it might work in some. Also, number three, extrinsic motivation, when it drives the desire to succeed on exams, such as when the only reason why they're trying to do well is from external sources of pressure like parents, that creates a situation where students are more likely to cheat. And if students believe that they're not likely to be successful on the exam, they are more likely to cheat. So if we emphasize learning over exams, we think about ways to reduce the stakes of the exam and we help students be internally motivated to do well because they can see that the information that they're actually using on the exam will help them in the real world setting. And we also set them up for success. We can create a learning environment where students are less likely to cheat. This slide has way too much text on it, but I promise I'll go into it in a little bit more depth. Um, and it's basically a summary of the second paper that is currently under review. Authenticity in an exam is really important, I believe. And I think that it's important that we engage students in dialogue about integrity, what that means for our testing, and also um, about how our exams are authentic. And dialogue is an important part of a lot of different learning theories. As educators, I think it's really important that we ask the right questions. On open book, open web exams, it's important that the questions are challenging enough. We want students to develop the skills to answer the questions, and in doing that, we want them to go out and find information, to think critically about what that information is saying, maybe even take a look at conflicting sources of information and evaluate the information in their response. When I think about some of the questions around grade inflation and stuff like that with open book testing, oftentimes my question back to them is, well, what are you asking the students? If you're asking a student to answer a simple knowledge retention kind of question, they can go out and Google the answer. Yeah, everybody's gonna get it right. But if you ask a question that requires critical thought in order to get to the correct answer, then your open book, open web tests are actually more useful for students because they can develop the ability to think critically and you're not gonna end up with great inflation. So here is an example of a question that I think is hard to cheat on. I've asked students to critique two aspects of the design of this course. Now, we've talked in the class about what critique means and I also think that it eliminates, at least mostly, the risk of a student going out and engaging in something called contract cheating where they ask some, where they pay somebody else for the answers to their exam. You can't really answer this question if you haven't been in the course and if you haven't been engaged in the activities because you need to draw on those in order to answer this particular question. Another thing is dialogue. So during my exams, instead of hosting Zoom sessions or live discussion sessions or, or live proctoring sessions, I should say, I host discussion sessions. So typically students will come to the discussion session uh, having already written the exam. They have saved their responses inside of our learning management system, which is Moodle, and they have flagged questions that they believe are problematic. Students then talk through and debate the correct answer with each other. I'm basically sitting there facilitating the discussion a little bit, but mostly just listening. And then the students are responsible for selecting the response in the case of multiple choice questions or for writing their response in the case of more open-ended questions um, that they feel is correct. The only time that I really intervene is when I'm listening to students and I can hear that, you know what? 
there's more than one correct response or this this question is wrong for some reason and considering all the literature about flaws in existing testing practices I actually think that this makes my exams stronger um, so that's the only time that I really intervene I've also helped with dialogue in um, a way by creating groups with students so sometimes students may not know everybody in the class and so I've created uh, what I call exam support groups which is what connects groups of students who are looking for somebody to talk to and they don't really know anybody in the class yet uh, this process of encouraging students to engage in dialogue I think really helps to build their critical thinking skills because it promotes reflection on the content it promotes learning because students have said to me afterwards that they learned a lot by actually doing the exam and I th really think that that is a good thing. Uh, I let them have access to pretty much everything in my courses when I'm teaching research and theory courses because that's what happens in the real world setting. If professionals have access to those resources, why can't students have access to those resources when they are demonstrating their ability to critique knowledge? Um, and I often use examples from the literature. This QR code will take you to a blog post that's got my full thing in the syllabus, but as you'll see, there's too many words on this slide too, but in the syllabus I outline, I use real world examples, but be careful because I often change things. Oh, and also researchers in the real world can't always do the best thing, and in this test I'm asking you about the best thing. So that also promotes some critical reflection on what they see in the real world. In terms of time limits, I think there is a place for time limits in some kinds of exams. I don't personally limit the sitting time on a particular test because in the real world when people are dealing with research and theory related things, we have time to think. We need time to think in order to respond and design uh, research studies and things like that. I think that allowing this time for reflection helps to reduce student anxiety and also incorporates choice into uh, the student, puts choice into the student's hands, which is really good for promoting something called universal design for learning. Choice makes it more um, inclusive. So I allow students choice in terms of where they're writing their exam because they can take it home, they can write it wherever they want. When they're writing their exam, I usually have the exam open for about a week. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes I negotiate that with students based on what else is going on with their lives. I let them choose what resources they are using on their exam. I also have done exams, now not all the time, where students can respond in multiple ways. So for constructed response questions where they're typically typing out their response, I've done an exam where I said you can use text, you can use audio, you can even give me a video as long as you answer the question. This helps to promote universal design for learning, which is essentially all about choice and reducing barriers to learning. There's also this idea of exam co-creation. So you can do co-creation in different ways, which is basically giving students some agency and voice over exam decisions instead of making them all yourself. Um, things like the dates that I mentioned that can be negotiated. One thing that I've done before is posted a list of the course learning outcomes and then we've had a discussion about which ones are the most important to make sure that I test on the exam. And uh, I've even posted a draft of an exam before and gotten student input on a Padlet before I made the final version of the exam official. If you're thinking about, wow, there's a lot going on here, um, there's a f I have a few recommendations. I think that we need to recognize that there are system constraints, there are faculty workload issues, it may seem challenging in larger classes, and we're under a lot of pressure to Im approve, improve sorry, the efficiency of education. And efficiency and co-creation or open book testing doesn't always work well together. So I think that we need to advocate for time to reflect ourselves and we need to advocate for some training and some support when we're trying to do these kinds of things. Um, I think we also need to reflect on our own practice and even if we make small changes in our practice that make our exams more authentic, I think that's better than um, doing only traditional exams. And I think that in order to shift towards the kind of exams that I'm now using in my classes, it requires the ability to have dialogue with students, but also to trust that they're coming from a good place, to trust that they're there to learn and to trust them a little bit instead of locking everything down because you're trying to promote the integrity of a test and you think that everybody's going to cheat, trusting them a little bit with that kind of thing. Also critically thinking about the context that our students will be working in in the future. If it seems challenging, I think a good strategy is always to use a variety of assessment types, not all um, 
just uh, traditional or open book exams, use a few different things and try and make sure that there are some opportunities for feedback. So one of the things that students really like to see is, you know, some response to what they got wrong on the exam. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. As I indicated earlier, I think small steps will get us there over time. I do think there's a lot of advocacy work to make this something that is able to be done everywhere. I don't think that it can currently be done everywhere, but I do think that, can, that it can be done in more cases than what it's currently being done in education.